By the way, this is a big picture that took about five minutes to download <laughs> on the Wi-Fi outside, so appreciate it, please. All right, experimenting with Q and Carvel. So this is us, I'm Dmitry. I've been working at VMware for quite a while now. Uh, infrastructure related stuff, Kubernetes related stuff, a little bit of Carvel nowadays. And I'm Rupa. Uh, I also have been working with Dmitry for a while at VMware. We work on Tanzu application platform and on Project Carvel. And previously we were doing some interesting Cloud Foundry stuff. And today we'll talk a little bit about Q and Carvel. Um, this is more of us sharing our learnings. Uh, we've been playing around a little bit with Q. And so we wanted to share you know, what we've learned about Q, what we've learned about how to use it, um, share a little bit about Carvel and Cap Controller, and talk a little bit about how these two projects fit together and you could potentially use them together. So just to set the context, um, we'll kind of talk about it in, in this idea of how to deploy a change. Um, so you know, thinking about making a change, whether that's a change in your source code or in your Kubernetes configuration, um, you typically, after you make that change, you want to create a PR to a Git repo. You have various sorts of verifications, tests running. Um, then after all that is clear, you've passed your checks, the PR is merged. Um, and then once it's merged, there's something sitting on your cluster that's uh, continuously reconciling. So it picks up this change and the change is deployed. Uh, so that's the broad context that we'll go through um, in the stock and also in the demo later. All right, so jumping in, Q, configure, unify, execute. So I've, I've been in a configuration land for quite a while. It's uh, started out with you know, playing around with various ways of how to augment configuration that you don't really own. Uh, you know, there, there's been name uh, thrown around like ops files. Uh, a lot of you are familiar probably with projects like Customize, similar space, right? And then there's obviously a lot of tools out there, templating tools like uh, you know, Helm, uh, JSON it, right? So there's all these tools out there that allow you to do this different types of kind of a configuration building, right? Q um, seems to be the, the latest one, uh, but it has a very unique twist. So maybe a first question to the audience, raise your hand if you actually heard about Q before. All right, quite a few people. And then uh, maybe people who used it, please raise their hands. Ooh, quite a few people too, all right? And then maybe how many people use it in production? So production will break if Q breaks. One person? All right, come up, come up, <laughs> come on up here, <laughs> help us out. <clears throat> so anyway, so Q, right? Um, what's interesting about Q to me uh, is that it doesn't just focus on configuration building, right? So this tool is so versatile, and the the way that it builds up, um, it's. Um, kind of a semantics around working with data is you're able to query the data, you're able to validate the data, you're really able to work with the data as if it was a you know, full-blown programming language, right? And that's, to me at least, quite exciting because in a lot of these other tools, right, you're able to go so far, but then at some point it's kind of, it's maybe not enough or maybe it doesn't quite fit the ideas that you kind of want to express, right? And so in our case, uh, what we're mostly interested in is using Q with Kubernetes, right? Specifically, how do you define various Kubernetes configuration? You know, how do you, uh, you know, mangle it maybe? How do you uh, allow your application teams to express some kind of application related definition, right? So that, that's kind of the space that we're most interested in. And that's obviously what, you know, this kind of a talk is about. Um, so here's a little example just to dive in deep. Um, so we have YAML, obviously everybody knows YAML, uh, on the left side, and we have Q on the right side. So you may notice they're actually quite, quite similar, right? Uh, but there seems to be a little bit of more, uh, maybe you can argue noise on the right side, but maybe to some people it's actually not noise, right? It's those very important differences that make YAML uh, sometimes ambiguous, right? So for me, for example, I'm a big fan of being explicit with what type of data it is, right? Now in YAML, that's a little bit vague, right? So, you know, if you look on the side over here, right, 
you end up with actually is my pointer. Yeah, you can see my pointer. So you can see over here, right, that config maps, right, they store string to string, right? And you have to really remember to quote your values, right? And so that's, that's potentially a common pitfall that somebody might run into and actually, you know, cause some kind of a problem, right? Now, in this case, the problem would show up when you submit this resource to Kubernetes. But seems like it's a little bit too late, right? Maybe it would be nicer to get that error message much, much earlier. Now, on the queue side, if we're taking a look at it, um, in this example, at least, right, you do also have to quote things, but you have to quote every single string, right? So that means that you can have strings that are unambiguous and not quoted, right? They always have to be quoted. Uh, now, the other thing here is that instead of indentation, um, you do have to use the curly braces, right? Curly braces really allow you to specify that explicit, like, what is this data really related to? Now, funny enough, though, you might think that, hey, this is the, you know, explicit nature is actually quite helpful. Uh, but uh, a few days back, I was trying to figure out, I was staring at my queue configuration, I was trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And it turns out I actually forgot to put the curly braces around, uh, but visually it looked like the name under metadata actually did belong in that section, but it actually wasn't, right? It was name and the metadata were in the same section, just because the curly braces are, were, were not there, right? So I don't know if there is some interesting question to queue developers, you know, how can we prevent cases like that? And maybe it actually the answer will be a little bit more obvious down, uh, down to the next few slides. <clears throat> And by the way, there is a command called queue import. You can import all your stuff into this queue format, right? And then, uh, you know, supposedly you can do more um, uh, usage of queue with it directly. Um, so here is the first kind of idea within queue that to me really made queue really unique. Types are values, right? And what I mean by that here is that, going back to our example of the config map, right? We have a data which is a string, it's a map of string to a string, right? And so in queue, you're able to express that directly in your configuration, right? And the following section, for example, or actually technically it doesn't matter which, which way you order this, but the following section will fail with an error message within queue if you actually throw in an integer over here, right? Because queue knows that the type of value that should be coming in here is actually a string or a string that you know, may be a little bit more specific. So we'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> now I did throw in a little hint over here. Values are ordered and that's actually gonna help us uh, in, a, in, a, in the next slide over here. So um, this is actually a little screenshot from the queue documentation. By the way, queue documentation might seem a little bit um, you know, rich and a little bit hard to navigate, at least for me when I started out you know, playing with queue a while ago. But once you kind of get the core concepts down, uh, it really becomes much, much easier to just orient within the queue landscape. So what is this thing? So going back to our example over here, right? When you define um, the type for this values over here as string, right? What's happening here is queue has this unique system where it's able to describe uh, the values in the lattice. Now, I'm not a mathematician or uh, related to mathematician in any way. So I don't know if that's actually some proper terminology related to mathematics, probably is, pretty sure it is. Uh, but the way this works out, right, is that, and maybe let's go with the most simplest example, right? So Boolean, imagine as a big group, right? What is the subset of that group, right? A subset of that group is true, and another subset of that group is false, right? And there's nothing else inside Booleans, right? So that means that if you define something of value Boolean, you can only have either Boolean as just, it's still a Boolean, right? So we don't know, we can't really refine it further, or it can be one of the children effectively, is it either true or false, right? Now with numbers, of course, it gets a lot more complicated, right? Because, you know, there's lots of different types of numbers, right? There's ints, floats, you know, you can potentially define some rules around it, right? Hey, is some number bigger than 10, let's say, or less than 10, right? And so. Q builds up for each one of the values a system like that, right? And you can actually get as complex as you want, right? You can have a Boolean or a number, for example, right? And so Q is able to figure out how to kind of boil it down to this what's possible and what's concrete versus more or less concrete, I guess, right? And so one of the goals 
for you as a configuration author, right, at the end of your queue evaluation is to get to a point where all of the values are concrete, right? So if I generate myself, you know, a config map, right, and half of my values are just type string, right, that's totally meaningless to Kubernetes, right? You need to have something within that string value, right? Either maybe empty string or maybe some non-empty string, right? But something, right? So just the type is not good enough, right? Now to queue, that's perfectly fine, right? But to us as humans, let's say working with Kubernetes definitions, right? That's just not good enough. And so you wanna be able to get to those concrete values. And so that's where the power of queue comes in is that to get to those concrete values, you're able to fill them in from multiple places, right? And so in this example over here, this value string is not concrete, right? But three over here is obviously concrete, right? So for this value, you're able to get to the concrete, you know, uh, point, right? And so going a little bit further, uh, uh, going a little bit further to the next slide, right? If you just think of, hey, you know, I got booleans, I got numbers, great, right? But then you actually want to be able to combine them into more complex types, right? And hopefully um, this slide is interesting enough to look at, right? Because you have um, a lot of this basic um, concepts, right? Like strings and maybe some maps, right? Well, actually pretty much strings and maps in this case, right? And so you're able to build up the definition of something higher level, right? So a config map in our case this is my own shared definition of uh, what a config map is. It's actually not complete, right? As you all may know, Kubernetes metadata is quite uh, elaborate. Um, but once you're able to define this more complex uh, types, right, you're able to reuse them and you're able to make certain parts of those types concrete, right? So for example, on the right, right, you're saying that this section is of type config map and you're able to fill out some of those things with concrete values, right? And so what we end up with is, if we'll take a look on the left over here, right? So API version, right? Uh, this little star, by the way, means that it's a default value, right? So if you, uh, if you don't specify something explicitly, like you don't specify a, you know, an explicit string saying, oh, this is whatever, apps v2 or something like that, right? It's gonna be v1, right? So this is concrete. Client config map, that's concrete. Metadata, right? Well, the name here is actually a regex definition. So that's a type of string, right? And so you should be able to get to something more concrete by the end of the invocation, right? And so in our case over here, metadata name, again, we're filling in a concrete value. Um, the labels and annotations here are, you know, maps on string to string. We don't really care about those. Uh, and by the way, actually here, I would argue that this should be marked with a little question mark to mark this field as optional, right? So you, you don't really have to have it. Uh, and then finally, data string to string, again, we already kind of looked at that. Um, and so here we make those things concrete, right? Or we technically could leave it empty as well if we mark that as optional. <clears throat> so this is my own kind of a hand-coded example, probably very incomplete, probably slightly incorrect, but can you imagine if all of the configuration for the Kubernetes that you write, right, would have this level of typing in much more detail, right, based on the Go types that the Kubernetes service provides, right? And so if you go and look at, for example, Kubernetes slash API Git repo, I think, where I think, yeah, I think it's Kubernetes slash API, right? You'll see that Core v1, Apps v1, et cetera, et cetera, all the built-in stuff, right? is all in that repository, all of the Go definitions, right? So wouldn't it be nice to be able to use this kind of type information when you're authoring your configuration so that you don't end up making the mistakes that potentially either get swallowed by your Kubernetes cluster or maybe you just get it, uh, you know, end up, you know, catching maybe downstream where it's maybe too late or just too inconvenient. So it is possible, right? And possible to you due to this type of, uh, level of kind of detail that you can specify, right? Now, obviously you don't wanna copy that stuff every single time when Kubernetes updates, right? Just too much work. And so you, here you end up using one of the features of Q where you're able to pull in the Go definition and Q will generate the Q definition for you, right? And now you're able to take advantage of those types when you're building up your objects. And so this, it, it looks something like this over here as I was showing on the right, but obviously it was a much more, uh, detail to what you can fill in uh, and you know there's a concept of actually I just remembered there's a slide modules and packages so 
when you do import Kubernetes API definitions, uh, you are able to reference to them uniquely, right? And for those who are familiar with Go programming language, Q, I think, is in a lot of ways inspired by the Go team. Actually, the creator of Q might have been on the Go team at some point. Um, and so um, there's a lot of kind of a same type of feel for packages and modules that's taken and that you can use in Q. Now, actually, the reason why I put in this slide <clears throat> is that because we have this common problem of um, being able to define configuration per type of environment, right? So like development environment, staging environment, production environment. Maybe you have, you know, five, ten production environments, right? So how do you actually cope with some of that stuff? And so with Q, right, um, once you kind of get to the concrete value, you can't really override it. And that's actually what makes this um, a little bit less error prone from a usage perspective, right? Is once, once you get to the concrete value, it's probably there is some duplicate configuration somewhere that's sitting that's maybe setting it to another concrete value and that potentially you didn't intend, right? Like we, we want to be able to capture that explicitness between, hey, I actually have uh, this field that I'm intending for somebody to configure versus here I have this field that's not really meant to be configured or maybe configured in two different places, right? And so that's what Q actually by default gives you. And what was interesting that um, I kind of stumbled upon at some point, which, which I didn't realize was, was the, the feature, is that when you, um, when you evaluate Q um, package or module, I guess, in a particular way, right? So in this example, I'm, I'm Q export dot, for example, right? Um, it's actually going to only evaluate the kind of the, the first um, depth of your module. Uh, and that actually surprised me a little bit. But then I actually realized that, you know what, um, the reason why they've done that, right, is that um, you want to be able to kind of nest your, um, uh, your, your further configuration, right? So for, for example, for a staging environment, for a development environment, in, the same kind, in, in this kind of hierarchy, right? So when you execute qexport.dev, what's happening is it's going to evaluate the module plus this kind of a nested thing. And apparently you can kind of go as, as deep as you want. And as long as you're not specifying duplicate concrete values, right, you're effectively adding in more to your kind of a base configuration. And so really you end up with this, um, you know, final configuration that has a bunch of concrete values that are specified once, right? Now you can refine the config, uh, you can refine each value you know, through the layers, I think. Um, uh, so maybe more concretely, right, you can start with saying, hey, this field needs to be a string, but then down one layer in, you can say, okay, well, this string actually needs to be at least 10 characters long. And then finally, maybe in the deepest layer, you can say, okay, the string needs to be, I don't know, my favorite password or something like that, right? So you can kind of refine this uh, value, right, through this um, nesting hierarchies, right? Um, or you can just go straight to, you know, to concrete value. But this does give you this way to kind of structure the modules such that you can reuse them. Now, this is not the only way to, re, to kind of refine the configuration. You can also import modules from one module to another. And so you, you kind of imagine how you can reuse the types and rebuild, uh, you know, rebuild kind of certain pieces of configuration in a composable way. Um, but that, that's kind of a little bit of an introduction to kind of modules and packages there. All right. Okay, um, so we are after lunch, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to raise the energy in the room a little bit. Um, we'll do some questions. Uh, how many of us here are you know, running Kubernetes? All right, it's a good number. And uh, how many of us are running Kubernetes in production? Okay, how many of us are familiar with Carvel? Okay. Uh, how many of us are familiar with like the Unix philosophy? Great, okay, okay. I think I, I, I know where we're at and hopefully you had a chance to move your hands. You have a little bit more blood flowing. Uh, so Carvo is kind of trying to bring that Unix philosophy to running um, applications on Kubernetes. So we wanna be building like a reliable, single purpose composable tool chain. Um, and you can use that for you know, building your applications, configuring your applications, deploying your applications, 
really the idea is um, taken from you know, how you, you might be used to, okay, I do this thing, I pipe it to the next command, I pipe it to the next command. That's what Carvo tries to bring to uh, application deployment on Kubernetes. So the tool chain is made up of a few different tools and we'll talk about all of them today. Um, so there's vendor, um, there's image package, cap controller, cap, um, kbuild, secret gen controller, and YTT. So let's talk about the local development workflow using Carvo. Um, and so, you know, let's say I, I've made some changes um, and I maybe have an application which has configuration in different sources, right? So I may have a Helm chart in a Git repo, I may have some YTT configuration somewhere, I may have some queue configuration in a different repo, uh, but my application uses all of that. So I want a tool which allows me to sync this configuration from different sources. Um, and that's where I use Vendor. So this is my tool um, to, to get everything and get all the, the configuration that I need into a single directory. Then the next thing I want to do is I've got all these dependencies, but I want to customize them. Like I want to provide certain values, maybe some things, some Helm charts are not exactly exposing the configuration I want, so I may want to write my own overlays. Um, and so that's where I use YTT to do that. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I really want to lock down the images that I want to use. So maybe I'm consuming an open source um, Helm chart and it's tagged by a particular, the image is tagged with a, a version number, right? So it may be like v1.2.0. But I don't want to consume an image which, with a tag, I want to consume it with a digest so I know exactly what I'm getting and I know that that digest will change when that image changes. Um, so that's where I'll use kbuild to resolve my image reference and convert it to being referenced by digest. Then I have a bunch of this um, different dependencies, right? So I talked about my application being made up of, um, you know, having a dependency on a Helm chart. Maybe I have, I have some queue dependencies. So I want to bundle up my application's configuration and all of the dependent images. I, I want to treat them as one OCI artifact. Um, it may not be one giant image, but I do want uh, a way for me to declare that these are all the things that I'm dependent on and I want to treat it as a single OCI artifact. And that's where I use image package to create that bundle. And then finally, I have everything I need. I have my configuration. I've done the customization I need. I've locked down my images. So I'm going to deploy it using cap. Now, these steps, I could, I could run these as is, but with the CNCF ecosystem, one of the great things we have is we have a lot of variety of tools, and each of the tools are good at doing different things. So I want something which is composable and that I can replace any of these with a tool of my choice, which means that I could use YTT for templating, um, or maybe I use Q here. Um, and that's kind of what this Unix philosophy and the composability gives you, is you can leverage um, the goodness in the ecosystem and use different tools of your choice when you want to. So let's look at some example local development workflows. Again, you know, looking at Unix, this may look familiar to you. Um, I could be using QExport um, and then getting, getting that output in YAML and then using kubectl to apply it. Um, or I could be you know, pulling down an image uh, that I've bundled um, using image package, and I could be then can, you know, templating it with Q, deploying it with CAP. Um, or the final one, the last one that I have here is really interesting because I am using Q, but then I'm also using YTT to apply a particular overlay on top of it. Um, so that, that kind of shows you like how you can mix and match these different things to really suit your environment and you know, what, what's best for that workflow. So let's talk about how we take this to a cluster. We're all running Kubernetes. A lot of us are running it in production. Um, so wh what do we do on cluster? So we talked about before, basically you know, your steps looking a little bit like, okay, I'm fetching some images, then I'm templating that, and I'm deploying it. Um, that's the three steps you're going through. So it would be great if we could express exactly that to run on a cluster. Um, and that's what we did. 
so also we want to be able to so sort out these, you know, have various fetch strategies, um, have various templating strategies. But that's exactly what we did with Cap Controller. So with the Cap Controller's app CR, you're able to define, here's what I'm fetching, here's what I'm templating, here's what I'm deploying. Um, and you're able to swap out at each of these steps, just like we talked about in the local development workflow. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know, what, what this could look like. So this is what your local development, um, your piping, your commands, you have that quick feedback loop. Um, but then on the cluster, you have Cap Controller, which is um, syncing or, yeah, syncing to your uh, Git repo or your fetching, you know, your fetch source of choice um, every 10 minutes. So it's continuously reconciling um, every 10 minutes. It's, it's configurable, so you could change that, but every 10 minutes preventing any kind of configuration drift. Uh, but also it gives you that same feeling um, of what you're doing in development, right? So the idea here is to really showcase how if in development you're used to doing render and then queue and then k-build image package and cap, that's exactly what's going to happen on your cluster. Um, so it makes it really easy for you to follow through, debug, um, you know, kind of logically understand what's going on. Uh, but you also get the goodness of it being continuously reconciling and it happening um, on, on your cluster. Um, here's a quick example of what using Q with an app CR looks like. Um, so here we have, you know, we're fetching from a config map. Um, you could be fetching from a Git repo or you could be fetching from a OCI bundle. Um, but here we are just, maybe we're doing local development um, and we just want to fetch from this config map. Um, we're templating using Q and then we're deploying using CAP. Um, so again, the, the, the idea being you could run exactly these commands in your local development flow and now you've taken that on cluster. Uh, here's what some of the cap controller CRs look like, and we've talked a lot about the app CR, which is really the, the, the core API in cap controller. Everything builds on top of it. Um, and then Dimitri will talk a little bit about the packaging CRs, um, and then we'll also do a quick demo using Q. Yeah, apparently we're pretty bad on time. I think there was a five minute reminder. Um, so yeah, the core API's app CRs, you already see an example in the slide, right? Uh, package install, package and package repository is really an optional layer that allows you to take that app CR and maybe distribute it to somebody else. But when you do distribute it, you don't really have to know uh, what exactly is happening within the app CR, right? So you don't really have to know that the templating is based on Q or YTT or Helm template, et cetera, right? So it's kind of a hidden away from a consumer. Um, uh, but, you know, at, at the core with app CR. So let, let's actually real quickly, let's see a speed demo over here. I don't know, is this uh, large enough here for we us? We have All one right, minute. So one minute, <laughs> perfect. Um, so let's actually take a pretty uh, complicated uh, uh, piece of uh, code that somebody else have written and I found uh, somebody did it with Q. Uh, it's a repository uh, by Thomas. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, what we'll do here real quick is we're gonna say cap deploy dash A example dash F and we'll throw in uh, cert manager here, and I'll close this. So we're about to install an app CR. We'll click on yes here. And so what's happening here, while this is gonna tell us things are reconciling, uh, it's we're actually fetching a module of Q from GitHub, right? This is the person who's authored a bunch of Q configuration for all of their services that they run on their clusters. Uh, and we're telling Q, hey, let's, uh, let's use this module and this particular package under the merge, uh, under that module, which is cert manager here. Uh, and we're also saying, hey, please uh, get us only the uh, list portion of the output from Q. And the list portion is a little bit funny. Ask us a question about it later uh, if you want. So uh, we actually did deploy um, cert manager here. And you can actually see that uh, cert manager namespace ended up here. And then if we take a look at pods over here, so we got, uh, we got a pod for cert manager, right? And so all we've done, right, is we just said, hey, we got some Q configuration in this Git place. Let's execute it with Q, and then let's deploy it with cap. And this is going to happen in reconciling 
you know, continuously on a cluster, walk away, come back, still there, still being deployed. Uh, so I think we're out of time, uh, yeah. but thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, actually put this one more slide here. Uh, go to qlang.org, great project. Go to carvel.dev, also great project. Uh, and please visit our Slack channel. We'll love to chat.